The last place on the planet one would expect mega projects to be taking place is Antarctica. After all, it is a 5.5 million square miles ice sheet with an average ice thickness of about 1.2 miles, and in some areas up to 4 miles, which is about enough ice if melted to raise the world's oceans levels by about 200 feet. Surrounded by the immense Southern Ocean, the closest inhabited town is Ushuaia in Argentina, which is still about 680 miles away. And since Antarctica is a literal cold, freezing dry hell with winds up to 200 miles per hour and an average temperature of about minus 60 degrees Celsius or minus 140 Fahrenheit in winter and about half that in summer, it is a construction nightmare. Yet many countries are quarreling over it, and thus quite a few amazing engineering constructions are happening there, which leads us to wonder, why is it so hard to build in Antarctica? What kind of construction materials are being used to build science stations there? And what are the most successful and cool projects that have been accomplished so far? As we said before, Antarctica is simply a continent-sized dry deep freezer with winds from hell. The barely endurable coastal areas are also quite unstable because as you have already heard in the news many times before, massive blocks of ice that are anywhere between tens to hundreds of square miles in size are breaking off and simply taking off. So, you could build a station in one location on the ice sheet near the coastal areas and the next day find out that it is moving since a shelf broke off. Additionally, massive cracks do appear in the thick ice out of nowhere and can literally swallow entire buildings. As you already know, the best buildings are the ones constructed on rock, but sadly, the only places you will find visible land or rock in Antarctica are the extremely limited rough trains right on the coast or the very few visible mountain peaks far deep in the continent. The continent also has only two seasons, a six-month-long winter and a six-month-long summer which is by the way called summer only on paper since the temperature in summer, depending on your location, ranges between minus 10 degrees Celsius to minus 35. Additionally, extremely stormy conditions can last for a couple of weeks, and not to mention Antarctica has six months of daylight in its summer and six months of darkness in its winter, including 105 days of total darkness due to the tilt of Earth's axis in relation to the sun. And contrary to what you think, Antarctica is actually a desert because it rarely rains and snows there except in coastal areas. All of this makes it nearly impossible for construction workers, architects and engineers to work and build anything, even a hut. Transportation-wise, even large boats that are used to transport construction materials, equipment, modules and supplies to the continent struggle and only have a limited few weeks long window to deliver every year. And there is only one port, that is McMurdo Seaport, otherwise the boats have to find suitable ice sheet edges to dock. To sum it up in a few words, Antarctica is an evil construction and logistics nightmare. Even the toughest construction equipment has to be modified to operate in such an extreme environment. The solution to this dilemma was prefabricated modules that are transported by boats, then transported on land to proper locations and assembled as quickly as possible. Energy is also a huge problem because to set up a station, you need energy throughout the construction process and during operations. Even when the station is uninhabited, it has to be kept warm inside or everything would be ruined from the extreme cold. Backup generators also need a steady supply of fuel, parts, and regular maintenance. The energy issue by itself is a project within the project. This leads to an important question. What are the best and currently in use materials and engineering techniques used in Antarctica and why? To answer this question, we will use an example of a particularly impressive station that was built over a period of about five years, from 2004 to 2009. It is none other than the Princess Elizabeth Station on the 1 million square miles Utstein Ridge, which is claimed by Norway, but the station is owned by Belgium. For starters, the station's unique aerodynamic shape and its foundation anchoring of tens of feet into the permafrost makes it able to withstand winds up to 200 miles per hour. It is also the only zero-emission station in Antarctica that runs on solar and wind energy through the use of a micro-smart grid, which has lead-acid batteries, wind turbines, solar panels, and emergency backup generators. What is truly remarkable about this station is that it needs no form of heating to keep its occupants warm because it is designed and built with materials that maintain its internal temperatures using only incoming sunlight and the heat produced by people and the station's electrical appliances. 
As you already know, insulation and ventilation are important issues that have to be addressed when building in cold places, especially Antarctica. Hence, the Princess Elizabeth station walls have a very unique nine-layer design. The exterior layer is made of a thick and strong stainless steel layer that prevents water from reaching the wooden interior. A layer of closed-cell polystyrene foam mat ensures an airtight seal around the stainless steel bands that are under the joints between each steel plate that covers the station. A layer of tensile and tear-resistant silicone also helps in making the station both air and watertight. The next layer is lamellate wood because it is a poor conductor and much easier to transport than metals. A layer of low-density polystyrene charged with graphite is also used as insulation because it is very light and resistant to moisture and water vapor. A layer of different types of lamellate wood is placed on the inside of the main insulation layer, while a layer of craft paper is used as another barrier that covers the entire interior of the station and serves as an extra vapor prevention measure. A layer of aluminum that is molded into one single massive piece that covers the entire station ensures that even the tiniest hole does not allow cold to slip through. The final layer is made of woolen felt, which further enhances the insulation properties of the panels. The wood panels and interior supports a decor gives the interior a winter resort cabin feel. These are the best materials that can be and are being used in making magnificent structures in Antarctica. This engineering marvel is solid, tough, well-insulated, environmentally friendly, self-heating, and is a real 100% zero-emissions facility. Of course, you are now wondering since extreme measures are used to make sure that such stations are 100% air and vapor tight, what about ventilation? The answer is innovation. The Princess Elizabeth Station boasts superior integrated heat exchange and ventilation systems that extract vitiated air, air without much oxygen, and replace it with fresh air around the hour while spreading the collected heat over the building. Mind you that the station is located 200 miles from shore at an elevation of 4,530 feet, on top of a nunatak which is the peak of a bellow, the thick ice sheet mountain, and has a magnificent view of the Sor Rondane Mountains that spans 100 miles long, with main peaks rising to nearly 2.2 miles high. It is a fixed station, so what about mobile stations? This leads us to the stunning and mobile Halley 6, which is the world's first relocatable research facility. It became operational in 2012. The station consists of eight pods, seven blue and of the same size and one red and larger. All pods together have a total floor area of about 16,253 square feet. Each pod sits on four powerful hydraulic-powered legs that can be raised and lowered to adjust to rising snow levels because coastal areas in Antarctica where this station operates do get lots of snow during winter. The legs are fitted onto skis so the modules can be pulled and transported to different locations. Between 2016 to 2017, the station actually was relocated to a different part of the Brunt ice shelf due to the appearance of a behemoth crack in the ice shelf. The pods were built in facilities in Cape Town, South Africa, and transported to Antarctica by boat. The pod structure is made from steel overlaid with insulated glass fiber-reinforced plastic panels. Design elements in the interior were focused on improving the living conditions of the 52 scientists and staff at the station. Unlike the Princess Elizabeth station which has large windows and gorgeous surroundings, Halley 6 has almost no windows. So living in it is the equivalent of being inside a submarine, but a rather very spacious, comfy one with plenty of entertainment options. Do you think the 29 currently operational stations in Antarctica will lead to the establishment of a giant scientific international vertical city on one of the mountain peaks in the heart of the continent? Is such a mega project possible and can construction firms conquer the extreme challenges? Let us know in the comments section. Thank you.